Welcome, everybody, and happy holidays. I'm Justin B. I am a son of an all-powerful and all-loving God and the host of Rico 12. Today, we have a special recording. I was approached around Thanksgiving time by um, a spearhead, a Rico 12 spearhead, Everly, who said she wanted to have a conversation with one of her uh, connections in recovery and share that with the world. Um, and it is now time to do that. I want to wish everybody a happy holidays as we will not be having a live meeting today, but it will be this recorded meeting. And I'm grateful for Everly for doing this. I turn this meeting over to my higher power and to Everly now. Welcome to Rico 12. My name is Everly S. And I'm a spearhead of an all-powerful, ever-loving higher power. I'm a grateful recovering addict and will be the host of today's recorded podcast. Rico 12 is an organization with a mission of learning and sharing the similarities of addictions of all kinds. We come together from all locations, cultures, faiths, and backgrounds with the objective in gaining knowledge, sharing tools, and hope with others that are walking a similar path. Speakers from past episodes have represented a multitude of different fellowships addictions, and afflictions, we look forward to continuing to add to the diversity from around the globe. Allow me to introduce today's speaker, Rico 12 podcast, Ensley from the Kilbourne Steppas Fellowship, to give his unique experience, strength, and hope. Thank you, Ensley, for being here today. And we will start off with the set-aside prayer and then move right into Ensley's experience, strength, and hope on the topic of gratitude, connect, and code from behind the door. Spiritual guide, higher power of my own understanding. Today, help me set aside everything I think I know about you, everything I think I know about myself, everything I think I know about others, and everything I think I know about my own recovery. So I may be open-minded and have a new experience with all of these things. Please help me see the truth. And take it away, Ensley, from the Kilbourne Steppas, with your experience, strength, and hope on gratitude, connect, and code from behind the door. I'm Ensley, grateful recovered alcoholic and addict. Chapter 9 in the Hope, Faith and Courage, Volume 2. And it says, When I first come into the rooms of Cocaine Anonymous, I heard someone identify as a grateful addict and alcoholic. For the life of me, I couldn't figure out how anyone could be grateful to be an addict and an alcoholic. I thought perhaps that this person was simply grateful not to be drinking and using anymore. After the meeting, I approached a grateful individual and he confirmed that he was actually grateful to be an addict and alcoholic. And this was the same kind of journey that I had when I first come into these rooms because I'd had a life of using, you know, well over 25 years. And the consequences of my using had ended up that the last nine years of my using was that I would put something in me. I would set off that phenomenon of craving. I would go on my spree and then I would end up behind prison doors. You know, that is exactly what I've done for the last nine years of my using. And then I would sit behind the prison door telling myself that delusional thinking that I'm not going to do it again. And then what would happen is I, as soon as I got my discharge grant, I would come out. First thing I would do was obsess, go after the dealer, go and then get my gear. And then I would go and put something in me and then just be a spree, set off the phenomenon of craving, just be a spree and ended up back behind the prison door again. And that was my cycle of using towards the end. I'm so grateful and introduce myself as a grateful recovered alcoholic and addict because that's not my story today. You know, what I'm about today happened there. It was acceptance. I had to accept and come to terms of accepting that I cannot use drink or drugs safely I can't put one in me because I've never, ever done one. Like it's always been one into my cycle and then, you know, consequences. I, I don't want to live and wallow in that misery of what happened there. And they just got worse and worse. So 
once I got that acceptance, when I come into the rooms, you know, that's when I got onto my, my recovery program. It wasn't just a straight, yeah, that's it. I've got it and come into these rooms and things. I was 11 months clean from behind the door. And then I come out and I spent 30 days coming into these rooms, never got a sponsor, never went through a step, you know, that ego, the pride. I picked up my one year key ring and I could see, you know, when I look back on it now, I could see people were looking at me and they were thinking, you know what? He's not going to stick around. He ain't going to last. He needs to get a sponsor. I can see it all now quite clearly. But at the time when you're in it, you don't see these things and people are giving me guidance. They're giving me suggestions. But my ego and my pride, I'm not listening. I've got my one year key ring. I'm crip walking as I pick it up. One week later, I have to humble myself and pick up my one day chip. And then a guy with 25 years experience come and he said, why don't you actually take this seriously? Get a sponsor and go through the steps. And I had to humble myself because I had to have that acceptance that. I didn't want to go back to that life. This guy was right. I've messed everything up that I had tried to do for the last 11 months and 30 days in the real world in that instant that I've gone and picked up. And everything that I'd promised and said and that delusional lie that I've told myself, I'm not going to do it again. I was just about to go and do it all again and end up with the same consequences. But I didn't. These meetings stopped me. Yeah. The fellowship stopped me. I picked up the phone I, in the madness after my, my lapse at a year. And instead of me phoning a dealer, I phoned somebody from the fellowship. You know, they met me for a coffee. And that was what brought me back to the meeting rather than me getting to go on my spree. Because I'd already started and I was off and running. You know, so I'm grateful. The book says... If a man has a desire, and I don't quote me word for word because I'm not a bookologist. I'm really not. I live this. I'm not a bookologist. I'm not perfect to telling you this page and that and this chapter and this section and all of that. But I know I do this. I work this program to the best of my ability and I practice it in all of my affairs. I've had to build my life around that way. You know, I'm grateful that I've got that life built around that way because I know that's my fail safe. It's given me more of a chance not to go back to the life that I used to live if I build my life around my recovery, not build recovery around my life. Basically, I put this first because then everything else falls in place. If I put everything else first, I know that throws me out of the triangle. That's just my personal experience. It took me a year to go through my steps with my sponsor because I sat down, I humbled myself. I listened to others as they were sharing their experiences in the meetings. I was so broken and I was surrendered. Like I didn't speak for a whole year. One of those ones there, the Zoom wasn't around. You know, I was going to face-to-face -face meetings and I wasn't speaking and I wasn't sharing back, but I had a sponsor and I was actively working my steps. I put in the actions to work my steps, you know, and anytime he said, oh, are you coming over? I was there. I was on time, listened. And he said, we're going to do book work. I've done my book work, you know. He said, we're going to go through this step today. I went through that step today. Do you see what I mean? That's exactly how it was. So grateful for my sponsor. I still have the same sponsor as when I first come in. If it's not broke, I'm not trying to fix it. You know, I'm not trying to change something that for me is actively working was, you know, when I do my gratitude list, when I was going through my first year was thankful for God, because once I was clean, I'd always had the God connection. I was raised as a Catholic altar boy. You know, I used to carry the candle. I used to go to church voluntarily. No one forced me on a Sunday. You know, I was one of those children. And, um, you know, from when I actually look back, from like 13, 14 years old, it's from when I stopped going to church that my life kind of turned around. Now that I look back on it, at the time, it was just a few little incidents that had happened. Me thinking, oh, God doesn't want me to come to the church anymore. And then me hanging around on streets and getting to know different people instead of hanging around with the, the church and nourishing things that you should be doing as a child yeah that's when my life kind of like spiraling when i look on it now look at the karma i've come back around i'm back into churches i'm back into spiritualism these ones and the book tells you 
five times in chapter 12, working with others. This is not a religious program. It's a spiritual program defined to one religion. This has got nothing to do with religion. It's to do with spiritualism. And I have, and I believe, I live my life in the best spiritual way that I can. Not perfect, far from it, trust me. But that's why I pronounce myself as recovered, grateful, alcoholic and addict, because at the end of the day, I've got the tools to manage and I've got the book and I've got my fellowship and you know, I actively work my steps on a daily basis because it doesn't matter how much clean time you've got. I'm five and a half years and I'm really grateful for it. But I've seen people with 10 years, they've gone. I've seen people with two days, they've gone. And I know that it. no one is really, really safe if you're not working your program. If you're not staying on top of stuff, you're not going to be safe in this fellowship. You need to be working it and you need to understand that it doesn't go away. The spiritual malady, the book tells you these things. You think it is maybe chapter 11, chapter 12, but it tells you about, I do work. It will tells you, it says, we found our way back into work. And my gratitude list is like, my first one is thankful for God. Second one is thankful for being clean and sober. Third one is thankful for recovery. The reason why I'm thankful for recovery is because I don't limit myself to one fellowship. I come into CA, I love CA. That's the fellowship I got clean in. But believe you me, because of the life that I was living from in and out of prisons and the street homelessness, jumping out from bin shoots with flipping heroin and crack addictions, um, like Oscar from Sesame Street, like I am not going to go and limit myself to just one fellowship. If I am in trouble, I am jumping into any meeting, any fellowship at any time to stop myself from going back to that life that I used to live. I'm not going to say I'm not going to do an NA meeting. I'm not going to say I'm not going to do an AA meeting. I will jump into any fellowship, and I mean any fellowship. There's many of them out there. And if you need to jump into a fellowship rather than to go and actively use, believe you me, do it. Because this, this stuff saves lives. You know, meeting saves lives. It saved mine. That's what I put as number three grateful for recovery and i mean all of it number four i put down for my work because you know once i started actively doing my steps i found work and it was only agency work i was so grateful for the fact that i wasn't having to go out there and commit crime look over my shoulder start being paranoid about the police and what's coming for me i would be working legit leave go home and i had that peace of mind that come with that so that kind of gave me a good support balance when I was going through my steps. You know, I wasn't having to go and commit crime, get the guilt, the shame, the remorse. All of that was kind of wiped out of it. I was doing meetings after work. So I'm just sitting there listening to other people's shares. Remember, I didn't speak for my first year. When I looked at it, I'm not actually doing anything wrong. And I've just come out from prison, served all of my time and done all of my sentences. I'm not on no probation or anything like that. So at the end of the day, you know, I'm living my life in the best way that I can, dealing with the circumstances that I have. And this is for the last 30 years of my using. I'm actively working my steps, trying to clear that and understand myself, coming to terms with accepting how my life is going to have to be now. I will go to work. I will go to meetings. I will then go home. And I'm not going out afterwards before I'll be leaving the house at 11 o'clock. I'm in bed by 11 o'clock instead. You know, there's the change. It talks about the psychic change. I had to have a whole change in my thinking, in my actions, in my behaviors. The whole change had to happen. If that did not happen, believe you me, then I'm working the other way. And I'm grateful. I'm so grateful that, you know, I grabbed that gift of desperation. It describes in the book. I grabbed that. You've got to be grateful, you know, when you've just, you're done and you've accepted it. And I grabbed it and I, you know, took the opportunity. I got my sponsor, got on and started doing my steps. And what happened, the ripple effect of that is like, I started seeing my family come back into my life because I'm clean, I'm well, I'm, you know, I'm busy. I'm going out to this meeting. They're seeing me with this person. I'm over there. This person's saying nice. I've bumped into that person. They're saying, do you know what? He's really changed. So I could change. And then my family has come back into my life and the ripple effect of that. Number five on my gratitude list is thankful for all my family, you know, even the ones that are not living their life right. 
I'd had loss in my life, you know, I lost my sister in 2009, a quite a big catalyst, my using had gone extreme, you know, she died Christmas day was our last day with her, Boxing Day was when she was pronounced dead, you know, that kind of made my spiral in because I told myself that delusional lie, it's all about me, you know, selfish, self-centered to the core addicts that's how we think and then i thought oh i can go and use on top of that which i spent every literally every christmas day behind the door from her death up until i come into these rooms now you tell me you can't be grateful for recovery i can believe you me i'm grateful for recovery because this year coming up will be my sixth year in a row that i am not behind the door you know, as long as I keep on top of this, as long as I keep doing this, as long as I keep actively working these steps, you know, and it will be my sixth year in a row. And I couldn't even get one, one year, you know, it works. And if I can do it, anybody can do it. A lot of people were sharing that. If this guy can do it, anybody can do it. And so I'm one of those ones. I fully believe everybody has got to go through their journey, but everybody can do this when they're ready. If they need it, it is there. There's a solution. Number five is the ripple effects, you know, and my family. I'm thankful for my family and all the other things that I get back. Number six normally consists of you know, what I've actively been doing the day or the meeting that I've gone to. And I don't have to go to meetings now every single day. I've learned and had experience because it's five and a half years I'm in now. I don't need to do seven days a week meetings, but I can't take my foot off of meetings. I can't just leave meetings alone and um, not go and do any unity and not do any service and think that I'm going to be well. I've had experience and life show up and a spiritual malady and I've, things rock me. You've got to put your foot down in recovery when these things happen. So I don't do meetings seven days a week. And I'm not saying that that's a, a requirement for anybody, for everybody. What I'm saying for me personally, if I was doing it seven days a week, I believe seven days a week and something showed up, I can't put my foot down in recovery. Like the book suggests, that extra meeting, because I'm already at my top end, if you can understand that. If you've been in a while, you can't go and put your foot down and get a little bit more extra out of it if you're already at your top end. What I do is I do three or four meetings a week. I go and do a share a month or something like that. Something turns up, I'm doing two, three shares a month, and I'll do that extra meeting during the week, what the book describes of. Because just getting sober and just getting off the drink and drugs, you know, that's that's just not the be all and end all of it. You know, you've got to do your work on yourselves constantly. We assess ourselves on a daily basis and we strive to make ourselves better the next day. None of us are perfect. None of us are Jesus Christ. And it's not a religious program. It tells you in chapter 12, it's not a religious program. It's a spiritual program. Doesn't matter. God of your understanding it tells you in page 86 to 89, upon awakening, it tells you get yourself into a daily routine. I done that. I get up, I go to work, I come home, I go and do my meeting and I come in, I eat dinner, I shower, do things of a normal person. I do my inventory, I, I do my gratitude list and I go to bed. That's my daily routine. I'm one of these ones here as well. Like I, I don't want to be in the madness. You know, this is about gratitude. Because I lived in the madness and if I'm in the madness and I'm wallowing on that and something happens, I'm going to wallow in that and then I'm going to think on that and I'm going to start telling myself the lie. So I live in gratitude. And obviously I'm not grateful for anything and everything that happens in my life, like when bad things happen, but I will try and see the good side of everything. I will keep myself as much as I can at all times in the positive side of thinking, because if I sit in the negative side, that will make me drive into the negative side and then I'm working on a relapse for me. So I will stay as positive and as high vibration as I can, you know, I will keep that faith, keep that belief that God is good, my higher power is good, everything will work out good. I can't go the other way because if I go the other way, it's like I'm flipping around my psychic change. The whole point is that I used to live like that. So I've changed and I want to stay in the gratitude side. I want to stay in the positive thinking because it was all negative before. I don't want to stay there. I want to come to the gratitude. I want to come to the positive. 
I do that self upon awakening daily routine. And if you've got a religious denomination, no matter what it is, between page 86 to 89, I think it is, there's three that are mentioned, a rabbi, a minister, and a priest, or something like that at that time. Really and truthfully, it says do that with your family at home. This is a spiritual program. It can't be brought in. You know, you have a God of your understanding. It's not a religious program, and it's not defined to any one religion because the illness doesn't discriminate. You can see that by the people that come in the rooms. It doesn't pick out, oh, this guy, he's Christian. I'm going to go to him. It's got nothing to do with it. It's an illness that's sent us in a human mind. So at the end of the day, you know, it doesn't pick up. I'm going to go with him because he's black. I'm going to miss him because she's white. No, it doesn't work like that. The acceptance, the book tells you. It's not like they didn't think about it. You can see they thought about this in 1939, pre-planned and set to help everybody who suffers from this illness. I'm so grateful. And honestly, I'm so grateful for the way that my life and turn things around. I know that you have your partner. How do you two handle gratitude? Do you handle it together as a partnership or do you handle it separately? Yeah, see, I, I understand what you're saying there. Now, for me, like my recovery is my recovery. And mm -hmm. we have clear borders and boundaries on that. I don't play around or get involved in anybody else's recovery. And I definitely wouldn't get involved in trying to push or trying to control or govern somebody else's recovery, let alone, you know, someone so near and dear to me who actually showed me into this program. You know, uh, the person that showed me into this program was my partner when I was in prison behind the door. So I would never, ever try and tell her she's a, a, a year higher than me. She's She's got a year's more experience. She knows this book so much better than me. She retains information a lot better than what I do. And she can memorize and quote, you know, she'll know certain chapters by, by the page and the page number and, and certain quotes and whatnot. Whereas I'm not like that. I'm just not one of those individuals. I write rhymes and things. So I don't try to memorize script. She's book efficient than what I am. So I wouldn't ever try and tell her about her recovery. We keep it kind of separate. She does her thing. I do my thing. She does her gratitude list. She's a bit more private. I'm a bit more open because I used to be private in my using. I used to be secret in my using. I used to be closed in my using. I shut off from the world in my using. Four years in isolation in my using. You know, so I try and keep my life as an open book and I share it. And like I said, I stay in the gratitude side of things. I try and keep it upbeat. I try and keep it positive. I keep it lively because if I go down into the dwelling and the, the self-pity and all of that kind of stuff that comes with keeping closed doors and secrets and whatnot, that will take me back there. But that's just an individual journey. So, yeah, we kind of separate in recovery. You know, it works either or either way. So that's a personal journey. But uh, yeah, I understand what you're saying with it. It's helpful just to describe that dynamic for a relationship works with two people. Don't know how a successful relationship can even work and make it through recovery if it's even possible. I think a lot of individuals think that the relationship generally ends up falling apart. I think your story with your partner is quite beautiful. And I would love for you a little bit on it, on how I saw her coming in to see you just, just yeah. because it was so gorgeous. Like when I heard it yeah. the first time, it was kind of like a Cinderella story. <laughs> yeah, it's um, true. It's true though. This is my life, you know. What how was happening is I was behind the door. She would come up and she'd get visits. Obviously, she was seeing me like once a week, twice a week, but she was coming up to visit me um, in prison and I'm coming out and she's turning up. She's on time. You know, her face is all lit up. She's got a glow on her and she was what? She's one of us, you know, and I'm looking at her, her eyes are all lit up and everything. And she's absolutely buzzing. I could see she was buzzing and glowing and floating around and she's chatting to everybody and she's coming in. She's making the whole visits room 
feel lively and bubbly and our visits was really 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 you know they were really nice you know the best prison visits that i'd had remember i've done nine years like all in all but like you know and i've had a lot of prison visits and they weren't normal you know the ones that were were behind the door when she was actively doing her steps i could feel the change behind the door i knew something was different in her you know and I'm sitting there and I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, well, that's not how she is when she's on crack. She's definitely not that lively when she's on weed. So I'm telling myself, because I can't actually see what's going on in her life and I don't know what's happening on the outside. You know, I'm behind the door. You know, that wall that they've got for the prison, it gives you that isolation from the world and everything mm -hmm. and outside issues really hard thing for somebody to kind of comprehend without actually living it the outside world becomes non-existent once you're inside a prison it, you know even you see little blips of things on the news on the television or something like that but really and truthfully you're not involved in anything other than what's going on because it's such an intense atmosphere inside prisons it's such an intense atmosphere. So everything is just all concentrated. You're like, that prison is just your own little community away from and the rest of the world, especially when you're doing lengthy sentences. The rest of the world is just kind of shut off. And you get that little taster of the outside when your visitor comes in. But And I can see that, you know, life was good for her on the outside. She's buzzing around all over the place. And it was so good. I couldn't work out what was going on. I'm thinking, oh, she's on crystal meth. She's doing something else. I'm going to come out and I haven't gone through anything. I don't know nothing about any steps or anything like this. And I'm thinking that she's on crystal meth. She's got herself a new boyfriend. You know, the lies that you start telling and creating yourself when you can't work out what's yeah, going on. Liar. Yeah, that warp thinking. Uh, she's got herself a new boyfriend. She's on crystal meth, and I'm going to come out to loads of drama. You know, she started saying to me, Hey, put this guy down on your visits list. He's got the same story as you. I'm like, Who's this guy? I don't know him. Do you know what I mean? I'm going to put him down on my visits list, but I, you know, you have to have that trust and that 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 honesty with each other. So we had it out and talked on the visit, and it was like, this guy's a good guy. He's going to help you out, and you know, he's he's somebody that he'll be able to guide you through. And she was saying, and I can hear her saying all of these words because I haven't had a book and because I don't know about the steps or anything like that. She was working her twelfth step mm -hmm. exactly what I can understand that she was doing now. But that's what she was doing is like H and I is what she was doing. And um, yeah, I'm sitting there looking at her and she's all put, telling me to put them down and I've done it all and everything. And yeah, and I come out and come into these rooms and this is what she was actually doing. It was like, OK. And then when I sat in it, the first actual feeling that I got was, OK, maybe this is just a new little plan of how people score. That's exactly what I was thinking. It was just a whole different 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 ball game you know it changed my whole life around from nothing to something like Woodrich. it changed my whole life around my zero existence when i'm back alive i've got color in my skin i'm putting weight back on because my using took me to the extent of where i was down to seven stone in weight skin and bones gaunt face red eyes not able to even smile look at anybody in their face, shamed, guilty. You know, it was a non-existence. And then now I'm back, I'm clean, I'm sober. My mind's starting to race at all the possibilities. The hope was being given to me. I can still create a life for me. I'd got a connection back with my faith. And all I had to do was just grab that gift and go through my steps with that courage. And I was so, so, so lit up. I got to go on two holidays on my first year. Like my version of a holiday would be, oh, I'm going to go and see the boys inside of a prison. You know, that's, that's, I'm going on holiday for a couple of months, but I actually got to get out of the country and go to other places and go into Morocco. First holiday I'd had in like you know, 15, 20 years, touched down and got there and just walked across and felt the sand on my feet and the waters rushing and the sun shining down. 
You know, the book describes the drink and drugs takes away the feeling. It's like, oh, I've arrived. The real thing of gratitude that you have to have for the book is the flip side of it is when you're actually getting the rewards of your sobriety, it was like, yeah, I've really arrived, you know, and I could feel the sun beaming down on my face, start assessing and thinking about a whole different way of what life can be like as long as I keep working this and I've done that and you know got through my first year and then I got to pick my one year key ring back up again it was just absolutely too much you know like he says in the book you'll get beyond your wildest dreams and the fact that I'm just clean and sober I wake up with that especially after what happened with my sister she went to sleep and she never got to woke up so I'm grateful as soon as I wake up my eyes I thank the higher powers, you know, that I've actually got to wake up because there's so many of us out there that, you know, they don't get to wake up. They don't get this solution. And that's why it's so important that we keep actively working our 12 step and working with others. That's the way that we work our 12 step. You know, we get in there and when life shows up and we no matter what's going on, we keep ourselves clean. And then what we do is if it all shows up, we get in the book and we start helping out others or doing like what you're doing here. Like It's amazing. You know, you're doing a podcast and it's going out and you can hear it out to the world and everyone can experience or get a taste of or get a message from it, a piece of hope and a little bit of more understanding in, in depth that, you know, this isn't a game. It saves lives and you never really know what anyone's really going through. So it's better to have something like this because I was four years in isolation. And if somebody had sent me something like this, this is inspirational for me. This might be my only lifeline, really and truthfully. I'm one of these ones. I'm not shy to say recovery has changed since the book was wrote. The world has changed. Things have got a lot quicker, a lot more advanced. So we need to kind of grow with it in a way as well. You know, it's adapted a lot things in place, but I'm not here to preach. It's not me for govern, but start looking at how more we can get these things out. And it's things like this that just make it so much easier for us to still get that message out and give what we need to give to so many more people. And that can only help the fellowship to grow and help families to grow, to keep people alive this stops people from dying, you know? It does. Having our conversation when we first met helped me understand my biological father, you know, what he went through. I'm adopted, you know this. He was a felon. Wanted, he had a lot going on. Learning difference, me too. There's no way he could have read the big book. Not a shot. Mm. There is no way that even if he did make it to getting caught. He died when I was three and a half in car accident. Through your story, I'm able to understand what his life was like. And I'm grateful at least to know what some of the things he would have gone through because they would be rather similar and forgive him and be grateful and know that I can not hold on to the resentment. Let's go out and spread gratitude and said, let's go out and be of maximum helpfulness. Yeah. So that's why I, I do really appreciate your story. And earlier when you spoke, getting out of that like morbid reflection mm. and that step 10, that watching for that frustration, yeah. that anger. Do you have any specific self-check that you instilled earlier in your recovery that helped you? Do you know what? When I went through my four, it was the honesty and the clearance of going through my four that kind of helped me to realize that if I'm going to live my life honestly in a spiritual way and do good, you know, I've done bad things. I paid for it with my, my sentences. It was petty crimes. Just done a lot of them because I was a, a prolific drug user. A, a prolific drinker you know I had to get honest and once I'd got honest shared it over I had no more things I just had to go through and make my amends and once I'd done all of that I then would be free that's exactly 
exactly what happened. So I got free. Once you're free, you just keep doing the next right thing, you know, and you're not going to get it right all of the time. But the book tells you to practice the principles in all your affairs. I took it to work with me. I took it at home with me. You know, I made sure that I am staying on my program every place that I go. It's not just I'm going to do it in a meeting, share back and give you some awesome power, share and then go out and start carrying on in the streets, shouting at my family. And you know what I mean? You have to practice it in your home. You have to practice it with your family at your family's house. You have to practice it at work. You have to practice it when you're going out with your friends. You have to practice it when you're going out with people who you don't know. You're going shopping or something like that. You need to be practicing these principles 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. That is how I do it. And you keep doing the right thing. And then when you get it a little bit wrong or whatever, you do the next right thing. That is exactly what I've put in as my program. And I try and help where I can help. And I can't help everybody. I'm not Superman and nor is anybody else on this planet. So at the end of the day, we just keep going through humanly where we can to the best of our ability, doing the next right thing. And that's exactly what I do with my 10 and my 11. And, you know, I get to live that life in 12. Yeah, the spiritual principles and the awareness of the humility to understand that I don't want my, my life to go back the way it is. And, and the honesty, one of the main things, but love, you know, you just keep giving love. Like somebody's coming at you with something that's not love, you know, just keep it moved. You're not involved in that anymore. That's exactly the acceptance around that. I'm not involved in that hatred if you're not working love, you're working hatred. I don't want to work hatred. I mean, we work in the side of love. And some people are still sick. Some people are still suffering. So you have to have that understanding and keeping the sides of your love and you're positive and you're honest. And, you know, you'll always end up all right in this program. You'll always end up all right. And it's worked for me so far. If I can just rinse and repeat, like it says in the book, what has already happened from before, I'm going to be. Ten and a half years clean. That's, that's, no time at all. In no time at all, because the five and a half years has flown by. Like it really has. It has mm. absolutely flown by. And when I say flown by, I mean I've been on so many planes. Like it's not a joke. It is really. Oh, just to let everyone know, Ensley sent me a photo from his vacation, the sunset. To picture that, and then not so long ago that he was incarcerated, mm. where it gave me chills. To think that those are the two options between sobriety versus the active addiction. calamity, the yeah. active addiction. And there's a part so, in the big book that it talks about, you know, half measures avail us nothing. We stood at this turning point. And that turning mm -hmm. point is the chaos versus the serenity, the right and the left, the dark versus the light, the choices that we make. Are we going to go towards that? grouch you know brainstorm or are we going to go towards the spirit of the sunlight and follow this program to the utmost open and honest ability that we can even though it, it's hard even though it's difficult and that's really what brought to my attention again do give your sponsor on it. And I was actually mm -hmm. at book work doing while I'm on the Zoom on my home group, Kilburn Steppers. But yeah, I, I gave him some guidance and the, the, the main guidance that I give is, is is making sure that you stay in the side of gratitude. Like that is the main guidance and, and reaching out and helping others because I do that on an active basis every single day. Um, I do it either by making a call over to somebody, just checking in on them or sending a little message through WhatsApp or you know, going around and actively going to see them, look in their face and make sure that they're all right. You know, especially if I know that there's somebody in here and they're new in or whatever, I actively go and I make sure. I reached out to 1,100 people and it didn't just, I've reached out to them and I've managed to help them. It actually helped me by doing that because when you've got stuff going on, the book, it says, reach out get involved, extra meeting, 
help others. You know, it actually says in there to help others. And that is the way that I've actually got through the struggles in my life. I haven't had to use on it. So that's the kind of advice that I give to my sponsors is if you do struggle, because I'm not going to be able to save you, you've got to have your connection with your higher power. But even that, you're still going to need to reach out and actively get involved with people in the book and going through the steps is what it tells you to do, as in to keep clean. Just keep on top of your program is probably the best and base your recovery program to make your life, not make your life and then put recovery in it, you know, make your life around your recovery and make sure that you've got yourself in that safe circle, keep yourself in that balance, unity, service and recovery. That's probably the best thing that I can suggest because it's, it's not easy. It's possible. That MV does ask how people are doing just to check in. Yeah. Put his actions behind it. I think that's also another thing, like the action. It's yeah. not just writing it down. It's easy to write it down on paper, but are we putting action to it? Yeah. It's the action, like even if you don't want to in step six and seven, if you don't feel like answering the phone, oh, when the phone is extremely heavy, we pick it up anyways, and that's where the gratitude ends up happening. It's usually when we don't want to do something the most is when we should be doing it. Yeah. And it takes you out of self. You know, I've had few life experiences. I'm not actually shy to share to people. You know, this has been one of my worst years of my life, not just of recovery, but of my actual life. I'm still grateful. I'm still clean. I'm so grateful. I'm still clean. But the way that I actually got through it, the solution of how I got through this year and stayed clean was because I was actively going to meetings in the book, helping others, doing my service, doing my unity, doing my recovery. That is how I got through everything that was going on. You know, there's no other way around it. And it's given me so much growth. And so much more experience. And it's given me so much more gratitude because it's made me understand if I don't do these things, I am going to end up because the obsessive thoughts didn't come in, but my behavior started acting out. You know, I had to address a few issues within myself. I had to get myself into a spiritually fit place. But God's not going to go to work for me. God's not going to go and actively go and pick up the phone and phone somebody else for me if I've got something on my mind. So you have to put in these actions. You can't turn around and give the talk. And I never understood when people used to say, oh, giving it the lip service. Well, giving it the lip service is going into a meeting, sharing back a message to everybody in the meeting but you're not actively working it outside of the meeting. To me, that's lip service. You know, you have to actually be working these steps throughout all of your affairs, all of them. That's even on a WhatsApp group to me, because I'm one of those ones. Like if you're going to take it in all of your affairs, or if you're jumping on a WhatsApp group, or if you're sitting around at your family's house, that's still one of your affairs. So you still have to work your 12 and you still have to, be actively working your program and that's the, the the way to stay clean and doing that anything that's kept me away from behind that door and to the beautiful beaches and the nice quiet life that i have today and i have a very very simple life it's absolutely amazing the life that i have but it's very very simple if i say i'm gonna do something like i said i'm gonna be here you know, I'm going to be here. If I say that I'm going to go over and I'm going to see my children, I'm going over to see them. If I say I'm going to put this money into that account, I'm doing it. If I say I'm going to be speaking to this friend and we're going to go out for dinner, it's done. I have actively had to think about how I plan my day and how I go about making sure that I stay clean and sober during that day. So everything is, you know, done in a nice, calm fashion. Because anytime it gets erratic and chaotic, it comes away from that serenity that you was describing and it causes that calamity. I don't need no more calamity. I just want the good stuff. 
completely understandable. Totally resonate with it. As addicts, that part of us, when we get on that spiritually fit side, I can always tell when things are going a little sideways. My mom has told me this since I was a little kid. Mm -hmm. (laughs) She said, messy mind, messy room. Always used to get so mad and indignant about it. And I was like, ugh. Stop it. And it's true. Whenever of some form of an addict, even as a child, it must have been food or I don't know. I was potty trained with m and so who knows? <laughs> but whenever my space gets very messy and chaotic, that's when that's when things go awry for me. You can tell I'm like ripping things apart. And so I have to have this system in place. Otherwise, chaos ensues. And it just starts to avalanche everywhere. And it only gets worse until I pause, count my blessings. I struggle with sleep and I found it very helpful to say my gratitude as I'm falling asleep. It keeps my mind from drifting off into those negative thoughts that keep me awake. And this is something, because of my lack reasons why I do my gratitude list at nighttime. Because if I sit there and I do the inventory sometimes I can look at myself and smash myself to pieces and it will make me dwell on that for the evening while I'm going to sleep you know because I do that you know last thing at night we retire to bed we've done our inventory but sometimes I do my inventory and I look at my day and I might smash myself to pieces in my inventory or you know I might be a little bit resentful or something and that would then sit there and dwell on my mind that's why I do the gratitude list at night time I remember the things I'm grateful for and it gives me a peaceful sleep mm-hmm. and I found that and also because if you get up first thing in the morning and you do your gratitude list first thing in the morning the rest of that day is like anything that you was grateful for for that day that's not going to be in your list it's like my daily diary of my joy of my recovery when do you do your inventory then i'll do it at night time but i'll always go to sleep on my gratitude list for the laps i was doing it during the day but then what happened is i lapsed i done my gratitude list in the morning and i've lapsed mm-hmm. later on that day and i've gone to a meeting and picked up my one day key ring after doing my gratitude list for being a year clean you know kind of humbles you you have to learn you have to learn from that experience do you see what i mean if i didn't learn from that then really and truthfully like you know i've done my gratitude list gone out used on the day and then gone to a meeting at night time and picked up my one day key ring so ensley just do your gratitude list get through the day be thankful you got through the day give thanks that you've actually got through that day You do your prayers and things in the morning, your meditation, you keep yourself to your daily routine, you go to work, you come home, you have your dinner, you have your dinner. Give thanks. Like that wouldn't be in my gratitude list because I'd be doing it in the morning. What am I going to do? Give thanks for my breakfast and then that's it. I'm not going to have no lunch and dinner for the rest of the day. No. Give thanks at night time before you retire, before you go to sleep. Be grateful you get to put your head down on the pillow. Get up in the morning. I always give it up in my head. You know, thank you for waking me up in the morning. That's a standard. That's a given. Get through the day. Give thanks at nighttime for everything that you've done during that day. The big book does say, these are the steps we took, which are suggested as a program of recovery. So when I was going through my steps, my sponsor, I spoke to him about the inventory and my sleeping struggles. My sleeping struggles I've had for a really long time. If it takes three hours for me to fall asleep and I'm tossing and turn like a flopping fish and doing my inventory right before bed continues that you know he said it's okay for me to do it a little bit earlier on the couch and just note that the next time I do it I'm doing it from that 24 hours from the last time I did it and it's gotten better where a year ago when I first started my brain was just warp speed my brain wouldn't shut off now i do run that gratitude list in my head and that helps me fall asleep you know you say okay i'm gonna do this it's done you you we're very similar in that i can tell that about your personality oh but i see the way that you come across and i can imagine because you do everything fast you're very efficient and your characteristics already you know, if somebody says something, you're quite honest and you're going to do it. 
Others will talk a good game. And I can see that that's what you do. You know, if you say it's going to get done, it'll get done. If you're doing that and you're intensely doing your inventory at nighttime, you're actually really doing your inventory. You're really assessing yourself and you're going to go hard on yourself, which is what my sponsor said about me. I went hard on myself. So I had to look at my attributes, not just look at my defects. Right. And that's what my sponsor said as well. You know, remember yeah. not to beat yourself to a pulp. Remember exactly. not to do this to a point where you're, you're smashing yourself back to the madness. Right. You're doing an inventory. It's bullet points. He actually had an amount of space that he said, okay, you're not writing a novel. It's bullet points. That's it. This amount of space. Small little bullet points just to get the point across. That's it. Because then it would turn into morbid reflection. Yeah, that's right. So I have to agree with that. It's, it's exactly how my sponsor taught me as well, you know. You have to not just dwell on that and smash yourself to pieces. You've got to look at your attributes, you know. And that's what I share back. We didn't come from all of that. I'm one of those ones. I smashed myself to pieces in the madness and i definitely didn't come from the madness to smash myself to pieces in recovery you know mm -hmm. that's that, that that kind of defeats the object of what the recovery is about how we're aware of it you know and you can embrace and it says this principles we use the principles before our personalities the book isn't misworded it could have said principles without personalities. That's why it's such a beautiful book, because the words, and I've got the original, you know, I was gifted the original manuscript when they've done all of their crossings and things like that, um, taken out this segment and put in this little bit rather than that, but they've got all of the workings out. And I've got the original manuscript um, for this book. You know, it was designed as a way of helping others and people being able to maintain substantial, substantial sobriety, permanent sobriety, a way of life. That's exactly what it was designed for. It wasn't stupid people that sat down and wrote this book, you know. They were clever people. They knew that what they were doing. And whether they knew that how many people it was going to, you look how many meetings and fellowships and the growth that it's had from where it started. You know, if you looked at it on a business scale, you know, it's doing well. It is. And the actual dynamic of how it is set up in a business form it really shouldn't work the way but it, it thrives <laughs> but that's the miracle of it <laughs> exactly and that's exactly. how you know that there's there's something greater than ourselves yeah that's really the gratitude part of it it shouldn't yeah. work it, it really shouldn't, shouldn't but it does yeah. some individuals maybe get gratitude mixed in with ego where if they're grateful they feel like it's self-centered to be grateful um or too much of yeah. self and i think that might be a mix-up in there do you know for me i was ignorant when i come into this program and i, I was ignorant like i was alone isolated ignored i i was dumb to the things in the world delusional in my thinking but ignorant the book gave me knowledge if i'm ungrateful yeah i in the madness which is what i was i was ungrateful for life you know i should have been appreciating my home my partner my family, my children. I was ungrateful. I was thinking about myself because I'm selfish. I come into recovery. I have to be grateful. Otherwise, there's no change. If I was ignorant, I've got to use the knowledge that the book gives me. Mm -hmm. It's a simple program. It's yin and yang. You know, mm -hmm. they're the opposite. Everything that it was, 
if you actually list down all of the things that you were, all of those defects, you have to kind of flip it onto the attribute side of it. And you've got to stay there because I am there. And that's the simplicity of it, really and truthfully. I had no belief. I had no faith. I had no courage. So I've got to have those things when I come in. Yeah, I had no friends. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to get friends in the fellowship. You know, I'm going to reach out. I'm going to actively work that side. You've got to flip all of those negatives from your using into your positives in your recovery. That's one of the main things that I actively try and do every single day. You know, I don't want to go back to the negativity. I've got to stay in the positivity. That is absolutely beautiful. And I wanted to thank you for coming on Rico 12. I know Justin appreciates you doing this and coming out, sharing your story, sharing gratitude, sharing all these wonderful tidbits on honesty, you know, connection to our higher power, selfishness. There's so many wonderful things. Your gratitude list, your story about your partner. Oscar the Grouch was so funny. Uh, the ripple effect. Everything was so beautiful. Um, I got so much out of it, and I'm sure everyone else did. I can't wait to listen to this. Perfect timing. The holiday's coming up, so thank you, Ensley. And would you like to take us out with a prayer of your choice? I'll just lead out with the serenity prayer. Okay. God. Grant us the serenity to accept the things we cannot change, the courage to change the things we can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. Amen. Do you know what? Recon 12, Everly, you've been absolutely amazing to everyone. Don't go anywhere. Stick around. Stick in recovery. Go through this book. I'm telling you, it's life-changing and your life will be better. It tells you that. I'm endlessly grateful, recovered alcoholic and addict. Wow, thank you so much Everly and Ensley. That is a great way to launch into the holiday season and to take things anew and afresh moving forward. Everybody keep coming back. It works when I work it, so work it. You are worth it. There was a man put his hand by the side of his mouth and he wanted to scream but the sound never came out So we reach for the bottle To wash the pain away Cause what he wanted so badly Was to live a different way And all of his problems all of his pain filled up the puddle and rose with the rain his ship kept on sinking to the bottom of the lake Just a fade, just a fade. Was a man put his hand by the side of his mouth? And he wanted to share, but only lies ever came out.
I live. 